you went to what prep school to the so i went to groton you went to groton i remember a mother almost slapped me because of that she <laughs> her da- she wanted her daughter to go to groton and so the daughter told me she said i'm applying to groton mr greco what do you know you know i said wonderful school honey academic i said so many of our presidents went there mm-hmm. but it's somewhat austere the mother saw me the next day she, how dare you tell her it was austere? I want it. <laughs> it, was, it was austere though, wasn't it? <laughs> it is. When I when you go for eighth and ninth grade, because my younger brother Jay went for eighth the same year I went for ninth. And um that the second and third formers, the eighth and ninth graders, are put in cubicles um where you, it's just big enough for a bed and a dresser. And there, it doesn't go up to the ceiling. You know, it's a, just an entire row of of They're like horse stalls. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the older kids, which included my brother Pegram and my brother DeSales, who were already there, which I think is why my mother wanted Jay and I there, um, they had gotten to vote. They had just redone the lower school dorms before we got there. The year they finished them the summer before we arrived. And they could have voted to have us have regular dorms with regular rooms with sort of walls and doors. But they voted that it should stay the British boys boarding school way. And it was actually really fun. I'm still friends with the girls that were on either side of my walls um, to this day. We did Pegram already, you know. Oh, you did! Excellent. I haven't watched Pegrams yet. I think somewhere right at the beginning. Excellent. No, I haven't watched Pegrams yet. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So go so ahead. Then, so from there, after Yale. Groton, I went to Yale. Yale. For undergraduate. Yep. And that was kind of a fun. Um, what you major in, honey? What's that? What you major in at Yale? Right, that was the fun part. So I grad, I I, mas- I majored in history of art all the way along because as a freshman, I took a class in history of art which I never had before, and I just thought it was totally fascinating the way you could through a piece of art dive into everything about a culture. You know, it was sort of the so- sociology and psychology through art was what it seemed like to me. Um, And all of my jobs and summer jobs and internships during college were all related to art history. And I did a lot of traveling and working in museums was enough to make me feel like that was not what I was going to end up doing in my actual life. (laughs) Um, And so in my senior fall, I added on a second major in psychology and child psychology. And because I'd always taken those classes for fun. I'd taken tons of child development classes because I loved working with kids. And it turned out that I had everything I needed to complete the major, except I needed one lab and one, and I had to write a second senior thesis. And so I knocked those both out in my senior year and was a double major in psych- child psychology and history of art. Okay. Mm-hmm. And from there then, Well, I I hadn't done the traditional child psych route. I assumed I would get a PhD in child psychology, but because I hadn't done any during college, you know, for summer jobs or internship placements, I didn't know what that was about. And there are a bunch of different PhD tracks you can do. So I applied around the country and by chance, um, the job I took was in a hospital. The others were in childcare centers or in schools, but this one happened to be in a hospital. And that led me over time to decide to go into medicine instead. Um, Because the job was working with extremely premature infants. So the babies that weigh less than 2.2 pounds at birth, less than a thousand grams, they, um, they were part of a national study. And I was, I was the psychology researcher at our site looking into what their long-term outcomes were for these extreme preemies. Um, and it was fascinating. Uh, so what happened next? Medical so, school, where'd you go to med school? Well, I was working at the big public hospital here in Dallas, Texas. And 
and doing that child psychology research. And what I ended up feeling was I was meant to do this uh, psychological test to ascertain how delayed the babies were in particular areas. I followed them through three years of age. And so what kind of speech delay, what type of um, fine motor delay or gross motor delay. And I ended up feeling like it wouldn't feel sufficient to just say, yes, this child is 18 months behind in their language when they would spend like six months of the year in the hospital because they had such breathing difficulties. I was like, I really want to be able to take care of the whole child, not just, not just send them for services in one area. Like if they can't breathe or they're intubated half the time, of course they have a speech delay. Um, and so I decided to go to medicine, into medicine instead. And there was a sort of the same trajectory. I went into medicine in order to do pediatrics. So I went by then I had Texas residency. So I went to the university of, I went to Southwestern medical school, which is part of the university of Texas system. And it was fantastic. It, it's associated with Parkland hospital where JFK was taken. Right, probably right. When he was, I remember it well. <laughs> I, I bet you do. Oh yeah. My reading teacher, the year before I had you, her father had died when he had a heart attack watching Jack Ruby get shot. shot. I remember yes. that too. Right. I was watching it. I was watching it. <laughs> and so whenever we got to that portion of, you know, that was so her emotional response to thinking about JFK, you know, was very specific. Right. Um, um, and so I, uh, but Parkland was an amazing place to train because it's one of the biggest public hospitals in the country. Like they, they deliver more babies every year. They're constantly vying with LA County for who delivers the most babies in the country. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you need to compete about, but they, there was a lot to see and do. So it was an exciting place to train. And I was working towards being a pediatrician that entire time until I got back to rotations in child psychiatry. And then I liked those just as much as I always had. And it turned out I didn't have to choose. Back then it wasn't computerized. You could, um, you looked in a big green book to see what all the available residencies were in the country. And as I was going through, luckily pediatrics and psychiatry are in the same letter. And it turned out that there was a combined residency in pediatrics, child psychiatry, and adult and child psych uh, and adult psychiatry. And it was called the triple board. And there were 10 places in the country that offered it, including Hawaii. Um, and so that's what I applied to. And so where did you go? Well, I actually, this was a little bit racy that your final year, as Mrs. Close would know from her daughter being a doctor, your final year in residency, kind of like your senior year anyway, or you're applying to your next thing, excuse me, right. your final year in medical school, you're waiting, you apply to the match where they line up the, you know, you put your top choices and all the hospitals rank you and you, you get this letter in your mailbox on one particular day, match day. And I didn't enter the match because what I had wanted to do more than anything was start a family myself. And I was pregnant. I delivered right before my med school graduation, a few weeks before. Uh -huh. And I did not want to start residency or internship with a little baby. And so I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to, go out on a limb. I really think I have a good chance of getting into residency, even if I don't do it through the match. And um, so I just spent my maternity leave year going to those 10 programs. And I ended up choosing one in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was associated with a wonderful pediatric hospital and they just had incredible um, scholarship in all three areas that I was studying. So that's where I went. And my son went with me. He was a year when I started. And, um, and then I had a daughter my third year there. And I would schedule her in. That year I was on adult psychiatry outpatient. I would schedule her as a child patient that I needed to see during certain 45 minute blocks of the day. And I would take her to music class, you know, like mommy and me music or, you know, feed her, play with her. It was lovely. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So from there. 
from there, when I, I knew that I wanted to be a community provider, you know, more like a pediatrician, where you have a lot of longevity, just like how you are reaching out to people that you've known over decades and decades. And so um, I was hoping in, in Ohio, I could have worked as a pediatrician in a pediatric office and then, and then seen all their child psych needs as they came in. But in Texas, that wasn't a thing. And my grandparents and my cousins all live here in Dallas and I wanted to be nearer to them. And um, so I ended up opening a psychiatry private practice, but I see children and adults who have some kind of significant general medical health need. So like kids who have, uh, who are recovering from some type of cancer and also have depression or diabetes and anxiety. So I work at those crossroads. I do a lot of collaborative work with other specialties. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. And I've been doing that here for 12 years. 12 years there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, Kelly. <laughs> Let me ask you this, honey. Um, in your field, psychiatry mm -hmm. and that, yeah. what, are, what are the major, um, what are the major disputes now? How is, um, What is the attitude towards Skinner, Skinnerian behaviorism? That's interesting. So I was taking part in a conference yesterday about the use of telehealth. So basically what you and I are doing during this pandemic. And, and they were talking about behaviorists and they were, because they were talking about it some in terms of, this was a group of child and analysts um, and my practice ranges from, I do a lot of biological psychiatry, like we do pharmacogenomic testing where we'll do a cheek swab and send it off to a lab and find out which medicines are less likely to work in someone and why. And, and if you're able to identify a needle in the haystack that's fantastic. If you're not, it at least clears away a ton of the hay. So you don't have as many drug trials trying to find something that would be useful. So I do some very biologically based things. And on the other end, I'm, I also do child analytic work. So not that many psychiatrists, um, you, the majority of psychiatrists don't have the luxury of doing therapy directly anymore. They're really often relegated more to medication management. But where I trained, we had amazing, all of our continuous cases were co-led by an analyst and a, a biological psychiatrist. Um, since the mind and the brain exist in the same spot. Uh, and so that's what I do in my practice. I see tons of therapy patients. I have a few people at a time that I see four or five times a week in analysis. But, but I use Skinner's techniques all the time when I'm working with parents, especially. Use it on you students, you know. <laughs> For example, I would, never, I would never praise someone two or three times in a row. Mm -hmm. I would wait. I'd praise them once and then maybe six or seven other, then I'd give them, then I'd wait a little while. So that, that is, random positive it, reinforcement. Yeah, intermittent reinforcement, and it works. Yes. Look at the gamblers. <laughs> Exactly. It works incredibly well. No, you're right. And, and, I, and I think I talk about Skinner with parents a great deal because when kids are constantly getting into trouble, you know, there are lots of older middle schoolers who, for instance, finally get a phone because they turned some age that their older sibling turned and got a phone. And then it's constantly being taken away because of choices that they have, that they either are unwilling <laughs> <laughs> to make differently, or in some cases, really unable, you know, to like think ahead and use executive function and, and not make that choice. The, um, another thing that I used from Skinnerian was when I wanted you people to be perfect in pronoun usage, <laughs> where you'd have to take a oral test real fast, right? Well, how, yeah. do I get to, how do I get to you the point where you're able to do that? And you had to get a 90 or above to pass, which you all did got hundreds. Well, successive approximation. 
you take a little step at a time a little step at a time. You know, honey, it still sticks in my mind. And I remember sitting in that psych class. Behavior. Mm -hmm. You shaped and maintained by consequences. The environment operating on, you know, you're the first four people on this interview, by the way, four out of the first five, two were philosophy professors. Wow. North Carolina, one at Wake Forest. There was another one who taught at, uh, at Oxford, Pegram. Huh, okay. I wonder who that could have been, right. <laughs> there was another one who taught at, who was at Yale, had everything mm -hmm. from Yale, mm -hmm. uh, born, okay. And then there was one who was an MIT professor at uh, Harvard, it was a hurricane expert. Okay. Wow. So these were all these five people. And I had, and, and it got to the point where I couldn't help but I'd ask them. I'd say, look, I'm doing a lot of reading, catching up in science, which I wasn't good at in high school. And I'm really, how do you feel about determinism? Mm -hmm. Do you believe there's such a thing as free will? Hmm. I haven't decided yet. I'm 88 years old and I'm going to kick off very shortly, I'm sure, in the next. And I haven't made my mind up yet. They said, it's up for grabs. They said, it's up for grabs. You don't, you, there's so much debate about it and everything that it's up for grabs. <laughs> and whether you make your mind up may not actually change whether or not it exists. Yet, I, have you been into memes yet? Meme Absolutely. There, there, have you have you read Susan Blackmore's The Meme Machine? No, I have not. But what sec it. I need to go back to the pronouns for a second. <laughs> As you've talked to all of us, have you? Do you have any advice for our children and spouses who are not so pleased that perfect pronoun use was so well ingrained into? their mother and their uncles. They well, feel like they are constantly <laughs> being found wanting because well, their English teachers are not doing as sublime a job. Well, one thing is for sure. And I have a new, the sign wasn't up when you were there, but I had one put up. Barbara made it for me, in fact, it stretched right across the front. And it said, it says, facts and skills are inseparable. You cannot be skillful in something unless you have the facts at your command. Mm. And every year, and this happens every year, a mother will come in and say, uh, you're having them memorize these 75 lines or do this or that. I don't want my daughter to be just memory. I want her to know how to think. And I say, oh, you want her to know how to think. And I'll push my chair back and I'll roll my pant leg up and I'll show her my bare knee. I says, you see that? Dr. Dr. Hodge, one of the foremost orthopedic surgeons in the country, put that new knee in for me. Do you men know how many things he had to memorize before he could do that and get that skill? I said, it's the same with me. If you wanna to know to use me or I, you've got to learn clauses, identify clauses. You have to memorize the cases, nominative, objective, you have to understand direct, you have to do all that. Once you know that in practice, you can't make a mistake. And if you people remember, I gave you a lot of oral quizzes where you're just writing that and you had to get a 90 or above to pass. <laughs> and most of you got hundreds. Of course, that was a honors class. <laughs> <laughs> fun and the one part of behaviorism that you didn't take part in because this is another one I talked to parents about is that random negative reinforcement I don't remember whether Skinner or someone else but who did this um um a, you know a type of study that couldn't be done anymore but we have the information from it where they took rats that had a you know a bottle of sugar water that could be electrified at the spout and the rats would come over and sometimes the spout was electrified and sometimes it wasn't. So, and any rat that had a rand intermittent negative reinforcer of a shock when they came to the bottle would just end up lying down and dying of dehydration right in front of a huge bottle of sugar water, even if it wasn't live anymore. 
it depends on what the contingencies of the right. environment are. You can and truly imbue hopelessness if yeah. the contingencies are are negative in just the wrong way. But this uh, th this thing, you know, this autonomous man mm -hmm. supposed to be inside and make the decisions mm. doesn't exist. There's no such thing in locate him. No, you're you're. It, Behavior is shaped and maintained right. by the environment, by your schedule of reinforcement. And death. Right. I've gone back and forth on that in the last 25 years, by the way, honey. <laughs> well, I think along with memorizing, I mean, because of how you treated us as people and you saw that we were capable of learning and applying and succeeding, um, we did learn how to think. I mean, we absolutely learned how to think and spent a bazillion years in in graduate school. But I but I was able to learn, you know, how how do I want to solve problem? How do I find best evidence? I, I was accused during quarantine of doing more continuing education than anyone that my colleagues knew. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's fun that love of learning that we absolutely got at the day school. Love of learning in, mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, what do you call, psych course, of course, they'll say, how do you display a love of learning? How do we know you have a love of learning? Mm -hmm. It's only by some of your behavior. That's mm -hmm. not to say I have a love of learning doesn't, how do you display and how do you set up your teaching things that right. children develop a love of learning. What are their behaviors that show they have a love of learning? You have to set those up. Mm -hmm. They have to work. Otherwise, you can't <laughs> listen. Now, now, I will say on the flip side, because we had to get a 90 or above, and you know, you had a real compatriot in my mother. She, she agreed with you that really a 95 or below was not a grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, I did find that I burnt out on grades. You know, by the time I got to Yale, I was like, I'm not even looking at my grades. I'm not telling my parents what they are. I'm redirecting my report cards because I have worked for grades for so long. And I'm just, that gets in the way. Well, they can either be positive or negative reinforcers, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But you also get to that place where as you, especially, it was fascinating writing my two senior theses at the same time at Yale, because they were both in prestigious departments with people that I had respect for. But in one, um, you know, I turned in something that I knew was not my absolute best for my for my psych psychology one. I had only had like four months to put it together. And for my art history one, I think I'd spent three years. I'd traveled, I'd read the works in the original, I'd seen the pieces, I blah, 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 and got something like a B plus on the art history one and an A plus on the psychology one. And so it, it gave me, it was actually useful in that sense of, I would have to make up in my own mind what I thought the work was, the value of the work was. Okay, dear, let's do this now. Let's go okay. back and reminisce. I want <laughs> you to go back and just throw out questions, observations, whatever you have about your days at Palm Beach Day School. By the way, honey, thank you so much for that generous donation. I signed that thing. I was usually opposed to that. But since Barb and I are doing this, I said, okay, sign my name. To it. <laughs> but thank you so much. Absolutely. So when, um, so one of my first memories, you know, there's the, there's the lead up to having the four of you, which was you and Mr. Bayless and Mrs. Close and Mrs. Bayless. Yeah. I, I came after Mr. Bayless senior, unfortunately was not there, but so there was that lead up. Like when I was in third grade with Mr. Young, I would remember going out because because that area was still open off the art rooms where we had lunch outside at picnic tables and you had that upper balcony your 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 so i rem i remember you leaning over the balcony looking down on all of us as we ate lunch <laughs> and you may remember there was a um 
you would be sort of in the background looking at things, observing as we had one third grade teacher who would dive through the trash and pull out sandwiches and say, there are children starving in Ethiopia whose half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is in here. Um, and that, you would just, do you remember her name? I, I do not remember her name. <laughs> um, but I do remember her tarantula. She was not my third grade teacher. But I, um, I, I remember you're just looking down and, and it looked like it was going to be really, really fun to get up to that balcony. Your room was so close to the library. There's all kinds of fun that happened upstairs. It looked like. <laughs> I had heard stories for forever from Pigram into sales who are three and a half and four and a half years older than I am. So four and five grades ahead. Um, I had heard all kinds of things like how we needed to be taking part in running our laps for sports because you might come and run laps on the field. <laughs> but I actually found that really helpful because I, I didn't like running laps and I found it, it, but if you would come and we could run with you, that was a lot more <laughs> enjoyable. If I could not think while I was running, it worked out better for me. Yeah, Pegram was really something. I really enjoyed him so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Barbara, I don't know if um, they told you, Barbara and Mrs. Mendoza went on a uh, something school thing to yes. England. Yes. They, they had to interview someone from uh, Oxford. And I said, well, Pegram's there. Right. So they went. So I said, wait a minute. And I went in my files and I pulled out. You remember the folders you people kept all your writing? And yes. when left, I gave it to you? Yes. Pegram hadn't taken his. What? He hadn't taken. I don't know why. What happened? So I gave I said, here, Barb, take it. And give it to Pegram. So <laughs> she gave it to him. <laughs> anyway, it was so funny. He emailed me the next day, or I forget what it was. Right. And I'll remember, he said, Mr. Greco, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for sending this to me. And he said, uh, I was re reading over it and I, I, I can't believe what a, what word did he use? What a self right, righteous little shit I was. <laughs> <laughs> Something well, that, I read. that was back when Pegram had changed his name for a while to, I'm pretty sure he'd taken over the largest bedroom in the house, which was the guest bedroom. He decided that was more fitting for an emperor and he changed his name momentarily to Robert Baker, Pegram, Caesar, Augustus, <laughs> something else, Harrison. Yes, and he'd actually, he, he went, you know how all of us go through different color phases. That room was much more grown up, but he decided it was his black phase. And so he got a huge piece of black poster board and set it up since he didn't have you know, Egyptian people with fans to fan him. He set up an enormous black fan above his bed that he could move back and forth like this. Yes. By the way, hon, how's your mom? Doing well. She and dad are both alive. They share your age. They were born in 33 with you. 33. I'm a year older. I'm a year older. 32. Okay. okay. Your mom and, uh, is amazing. In fact, I was telling Barb before we got on. Yeah. I said, I remember what I do remember so well about her, mm -hmm. whether I saw her in school mm -hmm. or on the field. I know what you're going to say. Or what? There was never a hair out of place. I don't know how she did it. but she did it. I thought what you were going to say was what you said when I, one of the times I first came back to visit you during high school or college, you were like, how's your mom? And then you were like, Hallie, my greatest temptation at all times, no matter where oh, I saw your mother, was to walk up and just mess up her hair a little bit. <laughs> so her hair is still lovely. And she and dad are living in a retirement community on the coast of Maine. Uh, Maine, she's in Maine. Maine. Mm -hmm. They're I'm in Maine. I'm here. They're not down here. They they were for a long time, but they're in Maine now. They're always by the water somewhere, which is something that the six right. of us share. So okay. There's fewer well, hurricane evacuations there. Do you um do you remember your public speeches? 
I do not, but I do have a question for you. Oh. I was going through, we've moved quite a bit in the last five years. And I was unpacking a box yet again the other day and I pulled out um, a little a little silver coaster for the Chapin Cup. And I can't remember for the life of me what the Chapin Cup was for. Barb, the Chapin Cup, that was the outstanding sixth grade student. Okay. Yeah, you were the outs, you won the, that was the big prize in the sixth grade. My goodness gracious. <laughs> well, it's perfectly preserved. It doesn't have a bit of tarnish on it. Take it out and put it on that back shelf up there. I can see. There you go, along with. Yes, my, yes. Inside <laughs> her, out characters. Put it right in there. <laughs> yep, I shall. Okay. Um, but sorry, I digress. You had asked a more pressing question about my public speeches. Oh, no. Yeah. I really don't. You were, um, as I recall, you were very good, always well prepared. You followed instructions. You did what I told you to do. And you were always within the speech thing. In fact, as I recall, I'm trying to think if it was who, some of the other people in your class. Like Katie Burdett, my Katie best Bur friend. Katie mm -hmm. Burdett. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think another top student in there. Um, your final speech was a 10 minute final. Okay. And you had to be nine to 11 minutes to be in the time thing to get a five. You right. remember that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And you remember your eye contact. Yes. During the introduction, 100% with the audience. During the conclusion, 100%. And during the body, 90%. You were had allowed to have notes, but just could refer to, you had to look at that. And I'm trying to think, I don't know if it was you or Katie Burdett. There was a couple other girls. I'm trying to think of their, I just looked at them, but I forgot them immediately. Yeah. Um, had a 10 minute, five seconds. It might've been you or Katie, I don't know. One of those other girls on the speech thing in a 10 minute speech, 10 minutes, five seconds. And you're timed, you're timed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so many parents used to tell me when we'd start the course, you can't expect kids to do that. They can't do that. And I say, well, we're going to invite you in and you're going to see how they do that. Yeah. Do well, that. and I'm back now to reading The Atlantic and other things that you would have us read. I mean, some of absolutely the best cutting edge understanding of, for instance, the coronavirus pandemic yeah. has been written in the Atlantic by people that are not physicians, but are really good at looking at data. And, uh, and, and parents would tell me, well, you can't expect them to understand. I, said, I don't expect them to understand any everything. Of course not, but that's okay. But they're gonna get a little bit and then they're gonna get another bit. But I said, you know, if I give them easy reading material, it's like if you want to build muscles and you start with five pounds right. and you keep on five and five, you have to increase the weight. The right. same with reading, you have to get more difficult and that's how they do it. But I, a, lot of, a lot of parents, I guess in psychology, I don't know what you'd call for it. And so many parents have told me this too. I don't want my child frustrated. <laughs> and I tell them, lady, Frustration is part of maturity. <laughs> That's how they learn through frustration. It's how you handle the frustration. Right. How you handle it with the kids. They have to be frustrated. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Tolerance, yeah, is one of the greatest gifts. I mean, I will say that I think our the ability to do public speaking that we all got has led me so, so far. Well, you know, honey, that big survey they did 10 years ago, I think I, 15 years, I don't know. It was a huge survey, general public. What do you fear most in life? Number one, public speaking. You know what number two was? No. Death, Death. Death. <laughs> <came to> number two. <laughs> no wonder Toastmasters will go on forever. Oh, <laughs> yes, oh, yes. And, 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 you know, and the kids, you know, and I've had kids who would, hyperventilate up there at right. the beginning. They would hyperventilate. And you had a brown bag. Sure, sure. And, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things I tell them, the, the first
first notes you get the characteristics of a good speaker, self-confidence. And then they'll say, well, tell me, Mr. Greco, what is self-confidence? And I tell them, I don't know. I don't know what self-confidence. I have no idea. It's something inside you. I don't know what's inside you. Well, then what do you tell? I say, but so many people say, oh, what a wonderful speaker she is. What confidence she has. And I say, do you know what they're basing that on? On what you do and what you say. And if you listen to me and talk the way I want you to and act, move the way I want you to, you could be dying inside from fright. It doesn't matter. They're going to say, what self-confidence, right? That's all it is. I don't, I don't know what self-confidence. Is there a feeling in there? Autonomous lady? <laughs> I do know what self-confidence is now. I think what scared the people that ended up hyperventilating was they had to stand so close to you. Going up to that front part of the room, it's very intimidating. Those of us with older siblings or people that were already, I don't know if you remember, but our governess growing up was a drill sergeant in the British Army in World War II, Corgi. And, and so we'd already gone down the intimidation route and we could maybe handle standing next to you with a little a little more armor <laughs> but she's lovely she's still alive she's 95 and in a retirement 95. community in west palm mm -hmm. yeah. wow just seems like yesterday that's funny isn't it i i, I can remember things from my first year here 1968 when? wow 68 and something that was right from before that was right before Pegram was born. Yeah. Yeah. And some things last month I forgot. So, but my doctor told me, he said, I have good news for you. I said, what's that? He says, as far as Alzheimer's go, you're not going to get early onset. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No early onset at 88. <laughs> oh, God. Yes. Well, I felt relieved when they told us at, at they actually did a nice job at the beginning of medical school, especially for those of us who were married. I mean, it was unusual. It was more unusual to have a female with a husband, but they'd set up a whole co-curriculum for male doctors, medical students who had wives. And it was about, you know, things to expect while your spouse is in medical school. And so my husband read it and he was like, guess what? By the time you get to year four, you will have forgotten at least 90% of what you, you learned in year one. And that'll be good because it will have already been proved wrong three years later. <laughs> and that was just sort of some of my latest training. I definitely, I, I, there are parts that I remember from, from Palm Beach Day, absolutely. Um, but then I'm sure that in the specifics, there's far more that I've forgotten. Well, you but know, I, go ahead. I have found this as far as people who are complaining about my making you memorize 75 lines mm -hmm. from Julius Caesar, Cyrano, my making you memorize the nominative case and the objective case, and memorizing those things. In the last, I'd say 10, 15 years, in a lot of reading I've done in mm -hmm. different journals, it seems to be that many physiologists in talking mm -hmm. about the brain say, memory work seems to help in right. including Alzheimer's. Yes. So I use that as one of the, okay, when parents say, that's not fair to ask, <laughs> but look, wait a minute, <laughs> I have another reason for you. <laughs> Let's just look down the line. Don't you want them to have late onset Alzheimer's instead of early onset Alzheimer's? <laughs> Um, they, they also, along with memory work, novel work, taking on something that you've never done before. You know, like if you suddenly took up knitting or if, you know, for learning a foreign language or that, that novel work seems to help with the brain being able to continue to cross train. Right. I've been doing, picking up on this reading mm -hmm. and I got into Darwinism. Yeah. And memes, this memes and the, all that. And what I found out is I have a poor background in science. So I have, among the meme book, I have um, 
the selfish gene. Yes. By what do you call? And I picked that up because there's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. Did you have Mr. Wagner? Was he at our yes. school? Yes. That's my son-in-law, you know. And he retired a year ago. So I call Richard. Phenotype, explain to me what this is. I, I don't know. And he has to help me with these, but I find this very challenging. <laughs> well, you're a, you're a great example of phenotype. I'm explaining it all the time versus genotype because you, it looks like you have blue eyes. I have what? Blue eyes. Blue eye, green. Green, they're, okay. They're red now. I have a problem with them. They're going to fix them later on. But okay. they were they were brown, and when I moved to Florida, they turned green. Wow. Imagine that. That's amazing. A doctor explained what happened, and it was very complicated, but they were brown, and they turned green. <laughs> I bet you, your, your ophthalmologist would probably have preferred that they'd stayed brown to protect you from the sun when you moved to Florida. So right. you would be an outlier, which is probably why phenotype is harder for you to understand. But for those of us with blue eyes, you can remember from Mendel's peas, which work a lot like eye color, that in order to have blue eyes, you have to have two recessive copies of the gene that codes for eye color. So it was often done as two little bees. Whereas if you have brown eyes, all you need is one dominant gene. It was autosomal dominant inheritance. So if you have one gene that codes for brown, it doesn't matter what the other gene is, the other allele, the other copy of the gene, um, you're gonna present, your phenotype will be brown eyes. So um, for someone who's double recessive like myself, you can look at me and by seeing my phenotype, you can automatically infer my genotype. You uh, know that I have to have two, both alleles homozygous for blue, because other time, otherwise, unless you had fake contacts in, I wouldn't be able to present with the phenotype of blue eyes. Yeah. So you can you can infer my genotype, but for someone with a phenotype of brown eyes, you would have to test them to know or look at their parents. Okay, I think he tried to explain something like that, not as well as you did, but anyway. But anyway, but honey, I, and I find this, as I said, it's difficult reading a lot of this stuff, especially when you get in some of the technical life, but on these meme theories. Yeah. I mean, do you believe that there's anything to it? That memes I, don't, are, I don't think I'm as well read. What is meme theory? Memes that this, like genes, mm -hmm. determine how we behave and everything that memes are the reason that man's brain is so large compared to the other mm -hmm. animal, like a, t and a gorilla who's much bigger, mm -hmm. but his brain much smaller. Mm -hmm. And it was these memes that needed to be find a place. And that's why the genetic thing mm -hmm. developed the big brain, which yeah. led to learning to speak. Mm -hmm. Why did we learn language? And of course, it's so debated now. Why do we learn language? It's so that memes can be transported. And what are memes? They're things of the culture. They could be writings, books, magazine, all these things that we say. And why do we? Why are we able to do it, and not the other mammals? Right. Because we can imitate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only that can imitate using imitate in the broad sense. Repeating. Right. Right. Says these memes dictate the way the genes do. Yes. Dicta the only thing the genes took millions of years. And these memes have only been developing over the last thousand or so. Wow. Okay. But so if you have a chance, get her Susan Blackmore that the okay. meme gene. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fascinating because, yeah, the way in which we've learned about how the environment and the consequences and the context turn genes on and off and shape their, how they are expressed. Right. Um, but everything that you're talking about in terms of communication really being meant to be able to communicate about these memes in a way that that it sounds like other species are not so prone towards. Yeah, well, and, and why does certain memes stick and others don't? This is part of the thing. Why do we pay attention to some? And again, 
She said, what do you mean by pay attention to? And right. How you're behaving in reaction mm -hmm. to that reinforcement. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. anyway, Callie, honey, it's been so great. It's been so great. And do you ever get to town here? Do you ever get I to haven't. Here? I haven't in the longest time. But that's what I was going to say. Even as far as reminiscences, even stronger than my reminiscences probably during school was what it felt like to come back to Palm Beach and to be able to come back to school and see you and see Mrs. Close and see, it just felt so, in, you know, and that you hadn't forgotten, you know, anything, but, um, but that you knew who I was and you knew who I was from a very young age. Um, it's just always been incredibly meaningful. So uh, one thing we, think a lot about in psychology and psychiatry is the idea of keeping each other in mind, you know, having an entire mental construct of another person and having that with you, even when you're not together. And that just do one cool. thing for me, promise okay. me that if you ever do get back in time, mm -hmm. you'll give me a call ahead of time so I can take you out to dinner, you, you and your husband, okay? I would love that. You well, have my word. Yes. All right. All right.